communion and worship. But I realize that most of us know the words, but we don't really understand the words. So we do things out of just culture, or that's what people are doing, so we don't really understand them. I'll give you an example. I think as a kid, most of us were going to school because our parents were taking us to school, but we did not know the main reason why we were going to school. I don't know. I, I didn't know. How many of you knew that? Why were you being dressed up every morning and taken to school? Yeah. You're in the same boots. Oh, so you also didn't know, but I think the rest knew. <laughs> ah, you guys. Oh, okay. So yeah. <laughs> okay, then. So you also didn't know like me. So in the same way, a lot of people come to church and then you are told, worship God, worship God, commune with God. And then they are wondering because they don't know why we should do it. And the only way you can actually get people to do something is to teach them to understand why they should do it. That is one thing I have come to understand. Why are we giving offering? Why are we worshiping? So we are going to delve into why we are worshiping and why we are communing with God and why that is important. Amen? Next slide, please. Okay. So communion... The definition of communion is intimate fellowship or communication or rapport. Intimate fellowship, communication or rapport. And then worship is to honor, love, and respect. So I was, my theme is communion through worship. Amen. So it's an intimate fellowship through love, honor, and respect. Amen. So through constant communion with God, we draw, from, we draw from God unlimited and infinite power. For instance, let's look at Mark 5, 25 to 34. Mark 5, 25 to 34. We can read it if the, uh, the mom team is behind, but I can still read it. Mark 5, 25 to 34. If anyone is there before me, you can also read. Mark 5. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the many doctors, had spent all she had, Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. Amen. He, turn he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can, you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around. Oh, 34. Okay. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Amen. So, God, or Jesus Christ as he was walking, had power with him. And it is the woman's conscious effort to draw something from him. So, by touching the hem of his garment, which is an intimate thing, everybody else was just doing their own thing. Like, maybe they would have just touched him, but they were not intentional about it. She was intentional about it because she knew what she wanted. And Jesus said, who touched me? Because power had left him. Another, another version will say virtue had left him, which means as the man walks around, there is power with him. So communion with him, worshiping him, you are drawing that power from him as well. So you being intentional about it and not just coming to church because everybody else is coming to church and not just worshiping him because everybody else is worshiping him. You will draw something from him that nobody else have gotten because you did it intentionally. Amen. Next one. We require constant nourishment from God. We require constant nourishment from God. Scripture in John 5, 1 to 4. It talks about, I am the branch and he's the branches. I don't know anyone who has seen 
a tree and the branches are somewhere else and then the main trunk is somewhere else. Have you seen a tree like that before? So in John 5, 1 to 4, he talks about that connection, that if you are in him, if you stay in him, then you are going to draw from him. If you are not in him, then you will not gain from him. So having that constant connection with him is being talked about all this time. So he wants you to commune with him. He wants you to worship him. He wants you to be with him because it's an essential thing for your survival. Because if you chop up the branches from any tree, it dies out. Amen. So looking at the vine and you being the branches, you cannot survive on your own. You need the main plant to survive. Amen. Next one. 1 Peter 2, 2 says that like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that it may help, it may grow you, it may grow up in your salvation, that you may grow up in your salvation. Crave pure spiritual milk. So as Christians, especially when you have just received Christ, you need to crave more of God. You need to crave it. You need to want it. You, just, you can't just walk anyhow. You need to want it. Craving is like an extreme want. Like when women are pregnant, they say they crave weird things. So the word craving being used here is like a strong want of something. So you need to want more of God. Amen. Next slide. Now the next one says, who should worship God? Who should worship God? We read from Psalm 148, 1 to 4. I think mom team can help us or someone can help us. I think mom team is now trying out their new, their new equipment, so they're a bit slow. <laughs> so we can read Psalm 148, 1 to 4. Amen. Amen. So there's a stress on all, all of creation, like the waters, the sun, the moon. So everything that God has created needs to praise him. Everything he has created needs to worship him. So long as he created you, it is your duty to worship him. Amen. Now the next one says, all his angels and heavenly hosts, all his angels and heavenly hosts. And then the 24 elders who get that scripture from Revelations 4. 10 to 11. Revelations 4, 10 to 11. I think I can read that. Revelations 4, 10 to 11 says, The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Amen. So the 24 elders are supposed to worship God. And then eventually everyone will. Maybe at this point in time you are thinking you are not ready to worship God. But scripture says that eventually everyone will. Amen. Next one. Why should God be praised and worshipped? Why should God be praised and worshipped? Now, believers are chosen to show his praises. Read that in 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. If anyone is there, they can read for us. 1 Peter 2.9. Amen. So we are all chosen to worship God. Amen. Now, worship glorifies God. Worship glorifies God. That is, your worship is supposed to give glory to God. Your worship is not supposed to give glory to yourself. Or you're not supposed to own yourself. Like, 
this worship is all about me or I am worshiping God, so thank me for it. It's supposed to give all the glory to God. Amen. So let's read that in Psalm 50, 23. Anybody there can also read Psalm 50, 23. Amen. Amen. Now, God inhabits the praises of his people. God inhabits the praises of his people. That is Psalm 22, verses 3. I think I'll read that one. Psalm 22, 3. Psalm 22, 3 says, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One, and you are. Am I reading the right one? I think that's the right one. So I think I mixed up the scripture. But there's a scripture which says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Think when you go lower, it's there. Amen. Amen. Yeah. The next one is it is pleasant to God when we praise him. It is Pleasant to God when we worship him. And that is in Psalm 147 verses 1. And also because of who God is, we need to praise and worship him. That is also in Psalm 147 verse 1. Anybody there can read it. Amen. Amen. Now. Because he is the creator of everything, that is why we need to praise him. That is also in Psalm 148, verse 5. And also, he is the king over all the earth. And for that reason, we need to praise him. Now, as I was putting together why we need to praise God, I realized that one of the, um, there was the psalm that seemed to move like the most. Especially this whole scripture was about the psalms. Everywhere I go, it's like, it's psalm this, psalm that, psalm this, psalm that. And who wrote the psalms? David. So David, the perfect man who wrote the Psalms, right? Yeah. So I realized that the man who is called the man after God's own heart, who was not flawless, but he was called the man after God's own heart, wrote the Psalm, which is all about praising God and which is all about worshiping God. So there is something that they did. There is an aspect of, the, of David that kind of overshadowed all his flaws. That was his praise and worship. Amen. Now, how should worship be offered? How? How should worship be offered? Is there a particular way it should be offered or there is no style to it? Let's start with Philippians 1.11. Philippians 1.11. Anybody there can read. Okay. So, with the fruit of righteousness, you need to be praise God. Filled with the fruit of righteousness. That is how you praise God. And also, it says, by giving offerings. That is in Leviticus 19, verses 24. In giving offerings... It's a praise thing. So remember the offering also between the two brothers, Abel and Cain, where one's offering was accepted and the other wasn't. So anytime you are giving an offering to God, it's also an act of worship. So as you're preparing your thigh, whatever it is that you're preparing, understand that it is an act of worship. So you don't go looking inside and you're like, okay, I think 100 kwa is too much. Okay, what about the coins at the, at the bottom of the bag? Like you should give a pleasant, acceptable offering. A pleasant offering. Amen. Now, where to worship? Where and how to worship? I think our scripture that was read right now says that there is no place like where and how. We should just worship in spirit and in truth. We can no longer say that this is the special place that I've prepared. Some people are like, there's this garden that is where people have been getting their miracles. So we all have to go to that garden. Or there's this mountain, mountain of fire. That is where people have been getting the prophecies. Or there is that. So the scripture says that 
in spirit and in truth. So it is not the location at all. It has nothing to do with the location. It has more to do with the spirit and then the truth. Amen. Now, the next one says, worship in the beauty of his holiness. you find that in 1 Corinthians 16, 29. And also, by our ministry in service to God, it's also a form of worship. I think every Sunday we announce that, oh, there are so many departments you can join. I've seen some people having beautiful cameras. They can take very beautiful pictures outside church. But when we come here, we're like, oh, mom team, we need people. Or praise and worship, we need people. But they, they sing very well somewhere else. Or they, there's, some, there's some talent hidden in them somewhere else. So this, this, this part says that by our ministry in service to God, we are worshiping him. So you can have the ministry, but it is not in service to God. Amen. Now, in unity with brethren. So meeting with us in unity with brethren, we are able to worship God. Amen. So we should not forsake that, 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 that unity with our brethren. Also, with thanksgiving, we should worship with thanksgiving. A lot more, a lot often I realize that's one thing that we forget. Like, every time everybody wants to ask for something, I want this, God, I want this. When it's time for prayer, I think it's a time to just want things or to ask for things. Yes. Most people think that it's all about the wanting and needing things. But once they get it, they flee. It's like, there's no need to come back and thank people. There's the story about the lepers where Jesus healed and then only one of them decided to go back and thank him. And the one who went back to thank him was made whole. There is something that you receive by being thankful. There is something that you receive. He said, you have been made whole. But the others were healed, but they were not made whole. There's a difference. He got something extra by going back to say thank you. Amen? So, when you worship, you should go with thanksgiving. Now, the, one, the next one says, with lifted hands. With lifted hands. And then, with a new song. With dancing. There's that story about David dancing. And then one of his wives thought he was doing a little bit too much. But that woman was cursed because of the comments she made. Now, when you come into the house of God, it doesn't matter how many steps you can make. It's like, this one is the best dancer. No, this one is not the best dancer. It's between you and God. It's not for sure. It's not because of Sel Selena puts two. I have two left foot. I'm always all over the place. Maybe you have one very good right one. Yes. So it's up to you and God. So far as it is pleasant to God, and it is not for human show, it is not for display. It's between you and God. Amen. Now, the next one says that worship with understanding. i like us to read that scripture from 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Anybody there can read. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Amen. So praying and singing go hand in hand. I don't know. Did anyone feel a difference in the atmosphere today during praise and worship? Anybody? A difference in the atmosphere? As you were climbing down the stairs, do you feel a difference in the atmosphere? So when you are, you, are, you are a worship leader and you are brought to worship, you'd realize that it goes hand in hand with prayer also. So you don't spend the entire week doing whatever you want to do, and then on Sunday you think that you magically come and stand here and be something else. It is what you have cultivated during the week that you bring here behind the pulpit to us in communion with the, with, with the saints. So as you have been given that opportunity to lead people in worship, understand that it is not about you, but it's about God. So in preparing yourself with God, there's this man, forgotten his name, they call him Dusin, I think that he's Nigerian. He's, he, was, he was being asked that, what makes his praise and worship so different? And he said, because he spends time in his presence. He spends time in, the secret, in the, the secret place, and he just stays there. He's not like a songwriter or has special skills, but he gets all he gets because he spends time in his presence or in his secret place. So as you, you are given that opportunity to, to, to lead people in worship or to worship God, 
Spend time in the secret place. Spend time in his presence. Amen. Now, the next slide. False worship. False worship. Now, God does not tolerate false worship. It is actually forbidden. Let's look at Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Anybody there can read. Amen. Amen. You shall not make for yourself an image of anything in heaven above or in the waters below. I'm sure as they started saying it, somebody said, ah, then me, I don't have any idol, so I'm fine. But sometimes the idol is actually you. You are your idol. Or your stipend is the idol. Or your abilities is the idol. Your father is the idol. Your mother is the idol. I am saying this out of experience. Now, there was a time that I think it was Favor who shared that sometimes you put your eyes on people and then they let you down. It is important that when you put your eyes on people, they let you down because you're not supposed to lay all your hopes on people. At a point in time, you may idolize them by doing that because you think that this very person, ah, this one can never let me down. Sometimes they have to let you down so that you, you would not make an idol out of them. Sometimes you would study and then you would get a C instead of B so that you would not idolize your brain and your ability. Sometimes you would, you, would, you, would, you would lose an amount of money so that you do not idolize the money. You have to lose certain things so that you realize that it is not about the money. It is not about you. It is not about the husband. It's not about the job. It is all about God. So he removes the things that you want to place your hopes on so that you would hope on him. You would hope in him. You would trust in him. So you'd realize that these things are failing me. And then when you make it out, you are like, how did it happen? So it could only be God. It is not about you. Amen. So I'm going to share this testimony. I think after, after submitting my thesis and everything and defending, one of my friends just called me and was like, how does it feel? <laughs> and then I was like, eh, I feel more relieved than accomplished. And he was like, why? And I was like, because I went through a lot to get it. And he was like, yeah, but for some people, they'll be like, I've gone through a lot and I've gotten it. So I have overcome. So I, I am I, like, it's, it's something to boast about. And I was like, unfortunately, it is more of a humbling experience for me. Because I understood that it did not take all of my smart words to get there. That if it took just me, I couldn't have gotten there. It took God. Amen? So sometimes, as he was sharing his testimony also, there are certain things that happen and you're like, how did it happen? I remember when they, they, they told me, like, I checked online and then my paper had been accepted for publication. I just started wailing in my room because, Charlie, it wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Now, keep far from a false matter, also in Exodus. Also, forms of false worship, such as libation, cutting yourselves. They are, they are, that, there's this weird thing that you watch in movies, and some people even want to practicalize it. Like, they say it's called what, blood covenant or love covenant, whatever it is. And then they cut each other, and then they mix their blood. And this scripture talks about it, cutting yourselves. All these things are false worship. What are you worshiping at that point in time? Is it love? I really don't understand. Now, let's go on. Burning your children. Some people even went to the of burning their children. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is not permissible to mix idol worship with true worship. It is not permissible to mix idol worship with true worship. For instance, sometimes you would think that it's all about the people. The people are cheering you on. Oh, I have a great voice. Oh, I can dance well. And then you may be tempted. You become more carnal than spiritual. So when you stand here, all we see is the physical. But there is nothing spiritual going on about you. Amen. Do not mix idol worship with true worship. Now, worldly and satanic worship. Empty religious activities. Empty religious activities. Sometimes some people just follow a schedule. 
this is how they do it. At this point in time, we are all kneeling down. Okay. At this point in time, we are standing up. But what is the reason why we are doing those things? That's why I'm saying that we need to understand why people are doing those things. During my undergrad, one of the things I did most, I think, was church hopping. I used to do that with my roommates because I think we're exploring church. <laughs> Amen. So I realized that some churches had unique, interesting rules, like the Adventist church, they were like, okay, don't wear earrings. I wanted to understand why we don't wear earrings. I wanted to understand why we only worship on Saturdays. I, I wanted to understand why them don't go on Saturdays. They go on these days. I wanted to understand these little, little things. In the end, these things helped me to do away with religion because I realized some of them were just human rules and regulations. Or somebody had read a particular part of the Bible and liked it and said, okay, let me add that to my church when I open my church. So you would, worship, you, you, you would, read, you would read the Bible more if you, if you understand these things because it is not about what they are doing, the activities they have put together in that church, but it's about what the, the Bible is saying. It's about what Jesus did while he was on earth. So it's not about not wearing earring or wearing earring. It's not about going on Saturday or not going on Saturday. It's not about doing this or doing that. It is more about the pure word of God. What does Jesus really require from you? It is just communion with you. He wants you with him. He wants that intimate relationship with you. So you, if you throw away that rules and regulations, you would not say that I have come to China, but my church is not here. What is the name of your church? Church of Jesus Christ. What, 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 what? How do you want that church to be here? So because your church is not here, you would not attend church service in China. Why? Because my church is not in China. Is it about your church or it is about God? So when you understand these little, little things, some things will not matter to you. You would enter a church and once you feel the presence of God there, once the pure word is being preached, once there is praise and worship, once Jesus is being glorified and not the man of God standing in front of you right now, you understand that this is what I want. This is what I need. This is helping me grow in my faith. This is giving me a better relationship with God. So as I am communion, I am in communion with God and I am growing in my faith and I am being fed the word of God, this is where I need to be planted at this moment in this season of my life because I have come to China and not because of anything else. Amen. Amen. Now, when we're talking about the declaration and someone's like, I am declaring this and I am declaring that. It's one of the things that came to me that there's somebody I spoke to just recently and she said she doesn't know that there's a church in China. Yes. She's in my dormitory. She says she doesn't know that there's a church in China. And I was like, okay. So, having left your home, I think when you're in an African country, it's normal to have churches around. But if you are committed to it, and you have come to another place, one of the things you start asking around is, is there a church in this country? Where is the next Sunday? Who can take me there? Amen. So, it's your commitment to it. In the same way, you came to study all right, but you also find time to go to one restaurant where they have pizza. But this is China. Why are you not eating only noodles? Because pizza is more Italian. Amen? Now, the next slide says, meaningless worship. That which is based on only traditions. Meaningless worship. That which has no form or power. That which is unaccompanied by good deeds. That which is based on externals. The vain worship of legalism, worship performed by those who are unclean. So this removes the things that humans talk about, the externals, the traditions, the, 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 it widens your scope. So sometimes we go to church and all people talk about is those traditions, it's those, th those externals, things that have nothing to do with the main reason why Jesus Christ came to earth. Amen. And that is what we dwell on. So we are measuring in the minus. Hallelujah. Next slide. Now, we talk about, we want us to talk about his presence in worship. You realize that they said Moses went onto a mountain. That is in Exodus 33, 12 to 23. And he met face to face with God. And when Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone. And through that conversation, he told God to show him his glory. At the point, I'm told that as Moses kept covering his face, 
It wasn't because the glory was too shiny, but it was rather because the glory was gone. So to cover his face, you would think it's still there. So which means that he was less and less in communion with God now. So he didn't have that glory. But when he went there and met him on the mountain, when his, he came, his face was shining so much that people could not look at him straight, straight, straight up because of the glory of God that was bestowed upon him in that communion with God. So when you commune with God, more often you would have that glory. People go by you and then there is something about you that is different from everyone else. Something that sets you apart from everyone else. There is something special about you because of that communion with God. You spend time in his presence. That, 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 that quiet time that you have, that extra time that you have set aside for God. There is something special that is bestowed in your life. Something special that you receive from that interaction with God that no one else has because you have spent time. You have spent time. You have fasted. You have prayed. You have done certain things that nobody else has done. Amen. Now, the next thing is a sacrifice of praise. This is something that I like to talk about. The scripture, I think in Hebrews, that said, we should offer a, a sacrifice of praise as the fruit of our lips. A sacrifice of praise as the fruit of our lips. Sometimes we think that we only have to praise and worship God when the times are good. So it's like when everything is going well, when my school fees is being paid, when I have money in my account, when my life is moving well, when my job is fine, when everything that I want, I get. That is when I should worship and praise God. But there is more to it because it is in the times, the difficult times that when you worship God, you just go and you're like, I am worshiping you for who you are. Because that's what he said in his word. He says that if you do not worship him, he will raise what? Stones to do it. He will raise up stones to do it. So it is in those times that you need to go and just say that I am giving you the praise. I am giving you the honor because you are God. And that's just it. So forget about the pain in your life and go to him with the pain. And thank him even for the pain in your life in that season of your life. Amen. Now, Romans 16, Romans 6, 13 says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. The word instrument in this text means that instrument or a weapon or a tool in the hands of God. So you and I, our members, that is every part of us is an instrument and what does an instrument do it's used for something so these are musical instruments so it's used for music and you and i are also what god instruments hallelujah so what are we used for to worship god that is just it the purpose so that is what instruments we are hallelujah so I cannot preach about worship, and we do not worship. We have to practicalize it. So I'm, I'm going to, we are going to use the rest of the time for this sermon to just go into a deep time of actually worshiping. So that when, when, when you can decide, I want, I want to lie on the floor. I want to raise up my hand. I, I, I want to stand up. I want to sit down and tell God that I am just giving you all the worship you deserve because we are in the sixth month of 2021. And when COVID started... I didn't know I could make it this far. Or when this month started, or when this year started, I didn't know I could make it this far. Somebody died today. So sometimes I don't like to make these references because I'm like, I don't need to think about the bad things for me to appreciate the good. Hallelujah. So we are just going to get up on our feet and just say, Father, I thank you for this season of my life also. I thank you for what you do for me. I'll just invite the praise and worship team to join us in front. Maybe just a few of them. The rest of us can just lift up our hands. As in Luke 19, 37 says, it begins by, he, it begins by say, saying that the dis disciples begin to praise him for the miracles he has done. The Pharisees said to Jesus, make them harsh, rebuke them. Jesus replied, if they do not do it, I would have the rocks to cry out. If they do not do it, I will have the rocks to cry out. Someone once told me that usually one of the things that 
he doesn't understand. I think it was a cell group meeting. Is that during our sermons and stuff, we would be like, if you want to receive Christ, come to the front. But the fact that the person made the effort to enter the church alone means that there is something or the reason why the person came to church today. So I don't know the reason why you walked out of your room to come to church today. I don't know what particular thing that is on your heart that you want God to do for you. Maybe you want him to change your heart. You want him to transform your life. You want to have that experience, that relationship that people talk about, but you've never, you've never experienced it before. So it is our prayer that as we worship in, right now, you would encounter God through our worship. Amen. 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 Let's just, we don't need to wait for the song. We can start worshiping God. Yes. Worship is not just about music. It's from the wordings of our hearts to God. So let's just worship God in the best way we can. Let us appreciate him for being God all by himself. There is no one like our God. Just lift up your voice, please. Lift up your voice and, and, and fill the room with worship. Appreciate him for who he is. There is no one like our God. He's so beautiful. He's so worthy of our praise. He has been so merciful, so, so kind, and so loving.